Good afternoon. I'm Marlene Young with the Canadian Orchid Congress, and this afternoon I'm absolutely thrilled to have Dr. Dennis Wiggum of the Smithsonian Environmental Research Centre join us. Dr. Wiggum is senior botanist with the centre, and um, we're absolutely thrilled that you've taken the time to work with us on these important issues. Um, uh, Dr. Wiggum, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you and maybe you can explain a little bit about your work at the Smithsonian. Thank you, Marlene, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this activity and hello to everybody up in Canada. Uh, I'm going to show you in a little while why it's important to talk about native orchids in Canada, but first let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've been at the Smithsonian for 39 years as a research scientist, so my day job is to conduct research and publish articles on that research. I'm at an organization called the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, which is one of the research units of the Smithsonian. As you may know, the Smithsonian is the largest museum complex in the world, located primarily in Washington, but they also have research units that do not have a museum function, and I work at one of those. It's a lovely facility on the Chesapeake Bay near Annapolis, Maryland, and we have about 1,300 acres of forest and fields and lots of wetlands and lots of estuarine habitats where once we walk outside of our door, we're actually in the space where we work. When I came to the Smithsonian, the emphasis at that time was on long-term research, and I immediately began to do studies of understory plants that occur in the forests all around us. And as part of that, I eventually focused uh, more and more on orchids for some of the reasons I'm going to show you uh, in a little while. The original research on orchids focused on orchid populations such things as population dynamics and pollinators of, of the orchids. But following a, a visit by a, a fellow from uh, Denmark by the name of Hanna Rasmussen, she came over and introduced us to the interactions that occur between orchids and fungi. And that has been an ever-increasing element of our research since that time. It's a fascinating subject that I'd like to share with you. And in this slide, you can see some of the reasons why we like orchids. They're beautiful. They occur in all kinds of habitats. And they represent an incredible diversity of life history strategies. So when we talk about something like pollination, the lady slipper orchid that you see in the upper left, that's a member of a group of orchids that do what we call uh, deceit pollination. They, they, they they entice an animal to come and interact with them, but they don't give any rewards to the insect at all. Other orchids do offer rewards to potential pollinators, such as the Platanthera praeclara that you see in the lower left. They have a spur as part of their flower, and in that spur is nectar, and animals come and drink the nectar, and when they do that, they stick their heads into the front end of the flower and effect pollination. There are other aspects of orchids that I'm going to cover a little later that make them incredibly interesting, and that is this interaction with fungi. It turns out that across the diversity of orchids, which is the most species-rich family on Earth, there are some members that have foregone making their own food. As you're all aware, uh, plants produce food through photosynthesis, but many, many orchids have decided that they don't want to do that any longer, and so they've lost all of their chlorophyll, or most of it, and they have no or very little photosynthesis. What they do is they digest fungi and they get 100% of the resources that they need to complete their life cycle by eating fungi, which I find kind of interesting. And it turns out that probably 90% of all the plants on Earth interact with fungi, but the interactions tend to be mutual so that the plant benefits and the, and the other uh, member, the fungus, also benefits. But in the case of orchids, as far as we know, the only member that benefits is the orchid. The fungus gets nothing out of it. And from an evolutionary context, that is quite interesting. So let's move on a little bit to our conservation uh, goal. Uh, ultimately, my interest in, in orchid research led to the desire to do something to conserve native orchids. And the reason for that is that a lot of orchids are in trouble. And some of them may disappear before we know 
anything about them to even do anything to conserve them. So we established an organization that I'll describe in more detail later to conserve all of our native orchids. And we have lots of partners in this organization that I also will explain a little bit later. So first, let's look at the situation in the US and Canada. The map that you see on the screen is taken from data that's in the, in the USDA online database. And many people, when I give talks about what I do, they are very surprised that there are any native orchids around. They thought that they only lived in the tropics. But not only are they around, they're everywhere. And this map shows the numbers of orchid species that occur in different states in the US and different provinces in Canada. So even as far north as Alaska, there are almost 40 species of orchids in Alaska. And you can see in Canada, you have, uh, you have a lot in your northeast. And uh, similar to the drier areas in the US, the central part of your country, there are fewer species. But in general, we think there's something about around 210 native orchids species in the US and Canada. And they are represented in about 66 genera, which it turns out is about 10% of all the genera of orchids on Earth. So even though we don't have many of the 35,000 orchids that occur around the world, we certainly have a very good representation of the genera of orchids. Let's look at some of the other information. In the US, we know that uh, over 50% of them are threatened or endangered in some part of their range. That tells us that uh, we have a little bit of a problem. What do we know about these orchids? Well, very few of them, here 34%, are being grown in botanic gardens. And as I click through here, you'll see that even fewer of them that are really seriously threatened are being grown and studied anywhere. So for me, that tells me that we're really behind the eight ball when it comes to understanding the ecology of our native orchids and how we can best go about trying to conserve them. And it's this level of information that has spurred me on for, for many, many years. Well, not only are we interested in, in living orchids, we know that to secure orchids in the future, that we are going to have to engage the public. We're going to have to get the public to be part of our team. And one way to do this is through education. So this orchid conservation organization that we've started, we're looking for ways to do interesting things that engage people in orchids. And what you're looking at on the screen is one of our first attempts. We have been working with a designer in Amsterdam to develop paper punch-out models of native orchids. This project is funded by a grant from the US Botanic Garden. We have set a goal of designing 25 models of native orchids. We call these orchid gami. And you're looking at pictures of 15 of them. These are all native to some place in the US and Canada. And we now have 20 of the 25 complete. And we've secured enough money to print the first three models as paper punch outs. We have all of them available as PDF files. So sometime, probably by late spring or early summer, we will have completed this project and will begin to integrate it into our educational activities. Now, my guess is you think these are probably quite cute. And in fact, they are. And I know that Marlene has been downloading the PDF files of the orchids that occur in Canada. And she's told me she's having a great time putting them together. So if you're interested in any of these things, feel free to, to contact me at the Smithsonian, and I can tell you how you can go about uh, receiving some of these or ob obtaining them. So in addition to orchid research and orchid conservation, education is a really important part of what we're trying to do with the North American Orchid Conservation Center. Well, here's what I do. Uh, when I'm not sitting at my computer, I go out into the field, and I look at orchids, and I look at other plants. Here you see me looking at an individual of Isotria medialoides. It's the most endangered orchid that we have here in eastern North America. And we're doing population studies. We're doing studies of its pollination. We're doing studies of its fungi. And we're trying to understand enough about this species so that eventually we can assure that it survives. You might wonder what that little cage is in the foreground. Well, this is a project that has been occurring at a national park just south of Washington and also at a military base at Fort A.P. Hill near Richmond, Virginia, where they have to protect species that are threatened or endangered. 
Uh, both of these places have deer, probably something that you're aware of in these eastern parts of Canada. And uh, so what we do with this plant, because there's so few individuals, is we put cages on each plant each year to increase the probability that that plant is going to survive. So these are the kind of things I like to do uh, when, I, when I have the opportunity. Now let's go and have a look at the orchids that occur on the property here at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And what you'll see in these photos is what captivated me at the very beginning. On the middle top picture is the rattlesnake plantain. This is an evergreen orchid. It replaces its leaves once a year, but it has leaves out there all year long. If you look at the orchid on the right, on the top row, the crane fly orchid, and then the one on the lower left, the putty root orchid, these are two orchids that have decided that it's not cool to have a leaf in the summer, so they produce their leaves around September, and they are out in the forest through the entire winter. They start to disappear sometime in, in May, and in the summer, when the plants flower, there are no leaves present at all. The tway blade in the upper left and the showy orchid on the lower middle, those are orchids that come out in the spring and they spend their summer uh, in, in the understory of the forest. There are lots of interesting things about their ecology. Uh, for example, that tway blade interacts with a single fungus, no matter where that fungus has been sampled, whether it's Iowa or, or Georgia or Maryland or Wisconsin. And then the showy orchid that you see down there in the, in the lower picture, that's a beautiful woodland orchid. And I've been studying its populations for well over 20 years now. And every spring in some of the plots where the plants occur that I study, we have lovely flowers. And over all of these years, we've never yet had a flower produce viable seeds, which is a bit of a problem. Because if you're not producing seeds, then how do you reproduce yourself? But it turns out that in these quadrats where I sample these plants, almost every year we see some new plants. So there's a real perplexing, perplexing question about where those plants came from. The one on the lower right is an example of an orchid that I talked about earlier, which has decided it's not going to uh, have any leaves. So it's lost its leaves through evolution. Uh, this is one species in a genus, the genus Corleriza, where you find the full expression, some species that have leaves and others that have none. What this plant does is it lives below ground for about 10 months out of the year. And then in the autumn, about the time the leaves begin to turn color, this orchid appears above ground. It's very tiny, only maybe four or five inches. And it produces the uh, seed capsules that you see on this particular picture. What's interesting about this orchid, because it has no leaves, it has to get all of its energy from someplace else. And the someplace else is fungi. And the fungi that this orchid interacts with and eats are fungi that are attached to the roots of trees. And so in essence, what this orchid is, is a parasite on a tree. And when you think about why it's doing this in the autumn, it makes total sense because the trees, when they're shedding their leaves, are also sending the resources from those leaves down into the wood and down into the roots. And this little orchid just sitting out there having a great time sucking on the goodies that are coming down from the tree. Let's talk a little bit about the tipularia. This is one of the first species that I began to study. You can see a leaf here on the left, and you see an inflorescence in the center. This is a fully open inflorescence, maybe 25 or, or 30 uh, flowers on the plant. And on the right, you see what the fruits look like when the seeds are, are being shed. If you look at that middle picture and count three flowers up from the bottom and the four fl fourth flower up from the bottom, you'll see there's a a structure coming out of the back of the flower. Well, that's a nectar spur. And, and it's translucent, so when you look at that, you can actually see how much nectar is in the spur. And we did an experiment where by measuring the length of uh, the nectar in the spur, we could calculate how much nectar was in the spur. And we did studies every day. And, and the whole idea was to find out who's visiting these flowers and what are they doing. And that can be shown in this diagram. We published a paper on this back in 1980. So you see that scale up uh, on the upper part of the figure. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you uh, during a period of about 20 days when these flowers are available in the forest, when the noctuid moth that pollinates them first comes and spends its time. 
So the first flowers that open, they have the most nectar, and that's where we find the moths. Uh, a little bit later in the flowering period, the moths are still there. They're coming, and they can tell where that nectar is, and they go right to the central part of the inflorescence where there's more nectar. A little bit later, they're still coming to the flowers, and they come to the upper uh, third of the flower where there's still nectar. But eventually, as time goes on, the only the upper tiny little flowers at the top have any nectar in them, but it's not enough flower to attract the moths, and they disappear. There are other things about this orchid which really were intriguing. We were studying its populations for many years, and we would never see any little orchids. We only would see plants that had what we thought were fully matured leaves. So what am I pointing at? Well, it turns out what I'm putting at is a baby orchid that's growing on that tree stump. And that enabled us to begin to look around the forest at locations where we might find small tipularias. And it turns out almost exclusively they occur on, on decomposing wood, either at the base of trees that have died or logs that have fallen on the forest floor. And we've explored this. We've looked at the fungi that occur in these little baby orchids. And it turns out they interact with the fungus that is so different that we don't even know what it is yet. So there are lots of mysteries associated with this orchid, and we think there are probably lots of mysteries associated with other orchids also. Well, here's what the underground part of a tipularia would look like. All orchids have a stage in their life history between the seed and the first seedling with the leaf called a protocorm. You see the, the word down there, protocorm, in the arrow pointing to it. So this is a protocorm of tipularia, and it's grown far enough that it has its first root. You can see that coming off to the right, and it has its first leaf. Well, the interesting thing about the protocorn is that, that all orchids have this life stage in their life cycle. The other thing that's interesting about it is that it's not green. You can see that very clearly in this photograph. So what this means is that in order for a, a little orchid that has germinated to become a seedling with its first leaf that it needs to make its own food, it has to go through a critical stage where it gets 100% of everything it needs from fungi. And that is almost unique to orchids, and it makes the understanding of the ecology of orchids really, really interesting. Well, here's a little bit more about that orchid, sit, that fungal situation. So we've got a picture of an orchid on the upper left and a picture of a fungus here on the lower left. Typically, the, the fungi that are associated with orchids occur in the roots, and you can see that over here with a little yellow circle on the right-hand side. And if you could look inside the root of any orchid that has these fungi, you would see that inside the cells in the root, there are distinct structures which are called pelotons, and you see one of them in the blow-up here on the low, lower right of the photograph. It doesn't matter what fungus it is, but whenever that fungus gets into the roots of the orchid, it takes this shape. They look like little balls of cotton. And, and it, it so happens that as far as we know, these pelotons are not present all year for any one orchid. There are certain times of the year when they appear. And when they do appear, um, they're very active. And what happens is the orchid then digests the fungus and completely eats it and it gets its resources. And we know that because we can do isotopic analysis of the orchids and the fungi and the pelotons and the plants that the orchids are connected to through the fungi. And we can show that, in fact, the orchid is getting all or some part of its resources by digesting these fungi. We don't know much about these fungi, mostly because it's been so difficult to work with them. But with the advent of molecular tools, we're now at a point where we can begin to do things and do experiments, which are opening and shedding a lot of light on what's going on between orchids and their interactions with fungi. Well, let me summarize what I've shared with you by looking at this life cycle. So I've mentioned that uh, orchids have seeds. And you should know that the embryo inside an orchid seed is what we call undifferentiated. It means it doesn't have much shape. The other thing that you should know about orchid seeds is that the little baby orchid that's in there has no stored food with it at all. Thus, it's necessary to get whatever it needs to grow from fungi. 
and on this diagram, we see the protocorn between the seeds and the seedlings. And then if a seedling survives, it grows, it gets bigger, it becomes a vegetative plant that doesn't flower. Eventually, if it grows and lives long enough, it becomes a flowering plant, which produces more seeds. There's another part of the life cycle of many orchids that I haven't shared with you. And that is that a lot of species have a dormant phase. So in our research, we could be out there looking at a plant one year and go back to the same spot and find it the second year and the third year. But maybe we go back the fourth year and we don't see the plant. Typically, you would think the plant has died. But we might keep looking and keep looking. And maybe later on, that plant comes back. Turns out a lot of orchids do this. And one of our colleagues at the University of Maryland was studying one of the lady slippers in the, in the national forest west of Washington. And he found that the pink lady slipper can be underground for 25 years and reappear. The orchids that we're currently working with, we know that they can persist underground for at least seven years. So when you think about that, that ties it really back into this fungal thing. How can a plant live down in the soil without producing a green leaf for one year, two year, or up to 25 years. That's, that's really a problem if you're a plant. So the way it works, it's the fungus. So we have these two stages, the protocorn stage and the dormant stage, where plants really are dependent upon fungi. So to look at the life cycle of orchids, we also have to bring in fungi. And what I'm going to do now is, with arrows, show you where fungi interact with orchids at different stages in their life cycle. And you can see it's every stage. The width of the, of the arrow is indicating how important that stage might be for an orchid to, to survive. So you really can't do orchid conservation unless you know not only what's going on with the orchid, but you also have to know what's going on with the fungal situation. Well, let me kind of end this uh, part of the webinar by showing you this diagram, which to us is what we need to do to become engaged in orchid conservation. We need to know about such things as what animals pollinate the orchids, if that's important. We clearly need to know something about the, the seeds of the orchids, how they germinate, uh, how they get to the next stages. We have to know something about the fungi that are associated with the orchid. orchid. And from a conservation perspective, we need, need to know how to grow orchids so we can conserve them and establish them in botanical gardens and things like that. So for us, to, to be effective and to really do what we want to do, we have to put this puzzle together. And I must tell you that at this stage, there is no orchid anywhere that I know of for which we have completely put the puzzle together. So we have a lot of work in front of us, but I think with the right kinds of collaborators and the right kind of intent, we can really put a dent in this and do a wonderful job of beginning to conserve our native orchids in the US and Canada. This is my last slide, and this shows the, the logo of the North American Orchid Conservation Center. And if you look at that logo, I hope that that uh, ties together everything that I've shared with you, which is you have the orchid, you have the fungi, you have the orchid and the fungi living in nature. Those are the leaves that you see there. And to really make it happen, we have to get humans involved. So a little bit uh, before ending on, on how we're going about this, uh, the Smithsonian is a big place. We have lots of connections around the world. We do a great job of bringing collaborators together. So our focus is to work with partners all around the US and Canada who share a similar vision. Some of those partners might only be working with seeds. Some of them might be working with fungi. Some of them might be working with propagation. What we have done is to look around the US and, and Canada to a degree, but we need to do it more there as time goes on is to find partners that want to collaborate with us. So what we want to do is to serve as an organizer to bring together people and resources that need to come together in order to do the things that I've shared with you. We currently have about 40 partners in the US and Canada, and that number will grow over time as we get more and more resources to do the work that we want to do. I would encourage you to visit our website, the NAOC website of the North American Orchid Conservation Center. You see the link there on this slide. We also have a, a Go Orchids website that I would encourage you to look at. The Go Orchids website is, you can link to it off of the NAOC website, 
But Go Orchids is a unique website adapted from a, a product that the New England Wildflower Society developed called Go Botany. And Go Orchids has every orchid in the U.S. and Canada in it. And you can find out everything you want to know or everything that we know about for any of these native orchids by going into the site, either by indicating where you are, what province or what state you're in, or if you know the name of an orchid, you can type that in on the front page. Or if you want to play botanist, you can go into the website and actually key out orchids. And eventually you work through the site and you come to what we call a species page. And when you click on the species page, it opens up and tells you everything that we found out about that orchid, its distribution, its status in any state or province. And that'll be an active site. That'll be one where we continue to add information to it. So I encourage you to learn a little bit about your native orchids in Canada. And if you want to share in our vision, come on to our website and you can find ways that you can do that also. So thank you for your attention and we look forward to working with many of you in Canada. Well, thank you, Dr. Wiggum. I have used that Go Orchid site, and I encourage others uh, others to have a look at it. It's quite easy. All you have to do is put in your postal code and bang, uh, it'll show you the orchids in, in your area. Um, uh, we have viewers that are submitting some questions, Dr. Wiggum, if you have a minute. Um, uh, one of the questions that uh, is being asked is, what are some of the other challenges facing orchids today in general? That is a common question when I speak to groups, and it can go in a couple of directions. Uh, one is that if, if an orchid is really showy and people want to have it, they dig it up and they take it to their house, and oftentimes that doesn't work because, as hopefully I've shared with you, you may not have the appropriate fungus with it, and so that orchid isn't going to live very long. So that's a bit of a problem. That's really more of a problem in tropical countries where orchids are being ripped off of trees for uh, floral purposes. Probably in North America, the biggest challenge to orchids is habitat change. We have learned, and others have learned, that orchids are very sensitively adapted to the environments in which they occur, so that whenever we do things that changes the air or changes the habitat through whatever mechanism, orchids tend to be the first plants that disappear, and it may be because their fungi disappear. We really don't know yet, but orchids, we refer to them as canaries in the coal mine equivalent in the orchid world, that they're very sensitively adapted to the environments in which they occur. But that's good also because what it tells us is if we're doing a good job of conserving our ecosystems, orchids will be present. Oh, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Now, in, in general, you mentioned a lot of, of partnerships that you've developed um, in, in North America and I'm sure worldwide. Um, how do you, uh, maybe you could give us an example so that our viewers have an idea of how uh, the Smithsonian um, interacts with others working on orchid conservation, on the conservation aspect of it. When we began the North American Orchid Conservation Center, we knew that we needed to reach out to others because nobody does everything. And we think that the appropriate vision is that we we collaborate with people that together can do more than we can do individually. So I have spent a lot of my time initially contacting botanical gardens and research organizations that I knew were involved in, in orchid research. And that's how we've led to the roughly 40 collaborators that we currently have. What we're doing now is to, to get focused to the point where we begin our real work, which is to collect seeds for seed banks, collect fungi for fungal banks, and begin the effort to learn how to propagate orchids. We're working on what we're calling a regional model, where I uh, bring together individuals in a given region, and each region will hopefully have at least one botanical garden, and they'll have other institutions that are interested in, in working together to learn how to conserve the native orchids and conserve their genetic diversity through seed and fungal banks. A good example would be we have a Midwestern group that is off the ground now. We have collaborators in Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and most recently Michigan has been added to that. That group is, uh, for the first time this spring, they'll be 
actively going out collecting roots that they send to one of the laboratories for isolating fungi, learning how to attempting to cultivate those fungi and identifying them. And they're also big, they will be collecting seeds for the first time this coming autumn. We have another group in the Mid-Atlantic, which uh, includes collaborators in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, and New Jersey. And next week I'll be going down to Naples, Florida to begin the organization of a regional group that will cover Florida and Georgia. So that's the model that we're working out, working on now in trying to actually bring the people together to determine what it is they would like to do, how we can support what it is they would like to do, and in cases where we might not have anybody working on a particular thing, try to solve that problem and find out what resources we need to do to move in that direction also. It's, it's very interesting and it seems challenging. I know you're just a handful of people doing this and you're to be commended for the amount of research and work you've put into this. Um, I really would like to thank you, Dr. Wiggum, for joining us today and shedding some light on the challenges and the, and the research that's being done at the Smithsonian and that there is a lot of friendly, user-friendly information on your website, particularly the Go Orchids website. It's a, it's a joy to work with. It's very simple and easy to do. So again, Dr. Wiggum, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Marlene, for the opportunity.